Welcome to the session on our root causes and remedies for rising insecurity, social unrest, war, violence, and global turbulence. A challenging topic, and to address this, we have a powerful set of speakers. I'll very, very briefly introduce them. Alexander Likotel, Professor, Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Alan Weir, Founder, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Jonathan Granoff, President, Global Security Institute. Anna Jerkovic, Vice Chair, Pagwash, Croatia. Philip Destan, Professor of History and Foresight, President, the Destry Institute. Now, this is a very, very brief introduction to our speakers. Our website has uh, more details. Moderated by Gary Jacobs, President and CEO of the World Academy. This session will identify the causes of uh, turbulence, polarization, insecurity, and war. It will analyze the deeper underlying social processes and discuss strategies to address these. Uh, we invite comments and questions from everybody. Please post them in, in the Q&A and chat. Uh, now over to you, Gary. Thank you, Janani. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Janani's introductions were very, very brief because to do justice, we would need half the session uh, with the rich background of our panel. Uh, and Alan hasn't even joined us yet. So feel free when the discussion, when you find it relevant to share background experience that, that from which you derive your views uh, rather than uh, comprehensive uh, uh, biographies. Uh, yesterday morning when we, or it wasn't morning actually, uh, at least for us, it was mid-afternoon in India. Uh, but when we started the first opening panel, panel we raised this issue uh, about the growing turbulence in the world, which has come somewhat unexpectedly, except to those who claim a, a third eye or a, a psychic vision of what's going to come, uh, uh, starting with uh, COVID and uh, uh, Ukraine, and then climate change been around for a long time, but suddenly it seemed to be much more real than it had been uh, for the last 15 years when we've been hearing about it. Uh, a sudden or not a, a progressive polarization uh, within societies. Uh, we saw it very much in the US, we're seeing it now in parts of Europe and other countries, uh, moving to extremes, uh, a polarization at the global level between nations which we thought had been going in the other direction uh, after the end of the Cold War, moving more and more closely together. Uh, a return of something like a Cold War mentality or more than, more than Cold War, it's hot war. Uh, and whoever expected nuclear weapons to be waved around on a flag uh, and threatened, which they haven't been for, I don't know if they ever were before, <laughs> threatened for use the way they were. They were always a threat, but that was behind. Now it's being come on the front page. Um, and then the recent breakthrough in generative AI, which promises transformative miracles and fundamental threats <laughs> to virtually all dimensions of human security, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and depending on what we do about it. And then, of course, the sudden outbreak of war in Gaza, uh, the clear uh, apparent weaknesses and incapacities of the multilateral institutions to handle the, the stresses that have arisen, uh, and a rising sense of insecurity, progressively increasing sense of insecurity among people all over the world, in spite of the tremendous progress we continue to make uh, in technological things, and for many people even in economic areas. So I'd like to start off with a question. I'm going to ask you, we'll go through, we have enough time to go through three or four series of questions. I'd ask you to be fairly brief so we can keep the, the momentum going, but let's, let's come to a, a clarity of, of where the group is on each of these. The first one is, each of these topics is covered in the press, it's covered in conferences, in the academy, there's no one, none of the ones I mentioned that haven't been discussed in one thing or another. My question is, 
is there a connection between them? Uh, and how much of a connection? And is there something that's been left out of the discussion uh, about root causes? Have we really understood that we can blame uh, Russia for one thing or Hamas or Israel for another and uh, we don't we're not sure whether anybody will blame China for COVID but we look we look for people to blame for just about everything uh, or Trump or whatever it is and I'd like to know whether you think there is something some common denominator between these apparently disparate events factors and forces that are causing an increasing sense of instability, uh, anxiety, uh, insecurity, and were termed in a recent conference in Baku, Baku the fractured, the fracturing of the world order. Uh, so let's start with that. We'll go around uh, and uh, and and then take stock and move to another question. Philip, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, Gary. So, you know, de de determining uh, an underlying cause for all these symptoms uh, seems rather futile and could even come down to uh, a linearity that our awareness of the complexity of the world would not accept. The, the fact uh, remains, however, that all the efforts and initiatives uh, done particularly for by the World Academy of Art and Science and the Millennium Project and so on, especially in the field of education, to highlight the complexity and the interrelationships between the various issues that is concerned are, are good to take and are salutary. But uh, this complexity reminds us that there is no simple answer to the obstacles affecting the implementation of, implementation of the uh, 2030 agenda, and that we will have to continue our efforts in order to, in, in a variety of direction, in order to uh, achieve beneficial acceleration and, and favorable outcomes. Perhaps there is one point uh, to stress that uh, the, the lack of uh, general interest and common good at the uh, international uh, level. Um, if there is an international soci society, th th that's a, a, a first question. We, we are in, in that international society, but uh, th th there are some groups, but... Uh, not a, a real uh, society. Uh, it is uh, marked by uh, a, a real flagrant deficit and structuring weakness of that uh, common good. Uh, you know that the concept of common good is uh, uh, in international law, the search of uh, an harmonious uh, balance between general interest and individual interest, between the individual and the uh, collective. Uh, there was a, a moment you, you talk about the, the period of the Cold War. There was a, a moment where the, the two great powers uh, realized a, a kind of supreme interest who was to maintaining the us civilization despite their uh, different models and uh, their different ideologies. And it was because they were afraid of uh, the apocalypse uh, of the nuclear. And, and we know that apocalypse is, is, is always there. But there was a, another great danger now is this, the climate change. And perhaps the climate change could be a way to be aware of, uh, to find uh, a new common good and to, to make all the, the people, the countries aware of that supreme interest that could uh, act on the, the creation of a, an international society trying to bane uh, crisis and uh, and and wars 
just like the the some you mentioned in Ukraine or in Africa in Yemen and there well, are many. Philip, if I if I've yeah. understood you, what I I think you said you don't really think there's any common underlying link. But there may be a relationship in solution solving for problems. Yes, because yes. of the severity, and we'll come back to that. Thank you. But uh, let's go around and hear from uh, uh, somebody else. Uh, Alexander, would you like to? Uh, listen, Gary. Of course, with pleasure. But um, I would say from the very beginning, I will express certain disagreement with you. You are talking about turbulence. I think that we're going through a perfect storm now, not just a turbulence. Life okay. comes on, up on us fast, whether it's upsurge in armed conflicts, the redrawing, redrawing of the global energy map, students pro Palestine protest, reminding more and more 1968. Yeah. We still remember that. Or a bit progress in artificial intelligence. The world changes at mind-boggling speed. This is what is happening in front of our eyes. We just watch that. We're witnessing. Mm -hmm. And this is happening so fast that we have no time, simply no time to understand the challenge before we find ourselves in a situation yeah. where any response is already too late and inadequate. Mm -hmm. Wars, in fact, are not even in, uh, inevitable. Though, inevitable. They, no, they are not inevitable. But they don't happen without reasons. Mm. Mm. The world is not just losing control of the situation now. The real problem lies, I think, in searching for solution in the wrong places. Mm. And there is such an interesting English term, rebalancing. I am not a native English speaker, so I just, you know, pay attention to all these niceties. That is, it is not so much a statement of the fact that the balance has changed, but it is really emphasizes subjectivity, that the subjects of various relations in the existing balance uh, are looking for new points of support for a new balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what keeps busy the world of politics today. The density of international contexts at the highest level and is growing exponentially. Not a day goes without some momentous meetings, consultations, negotiations, and anxiety only grows. In this, you know, reiterating Mark Twain, when I watch TV or read news today, sometimes I wonder, whether the world is being run by smart people who are putting us on or by imbeciles who really mean it, what they are doing. What we are experiencing now is more than a test of the durability of the post-Cold War world, uh, world order. It is its end, total and complete end of the post-Cold War order. Mm -hmm. Therefore, rebalancing is not sufficient, which is going on today. Two years ago, we had no idea that the new war will break out in Europe, the war that will destroy, explode the world order that existed before completely. Predictably, the first reaction was to glue the pieces together by politicians. But that's a bad mistake. And it's a very bad conceptual mistake. First, it is dictated by inertia rather than the reason. It is an attempt to reshuffle the core pieces of the old world, world, world order when these remaining pieces do not fit together anymore completely. When I listen to Alexander, that's great, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I mean, you have, you, I think we're, go we're going to come to solutions and how we should do it. But I think you've, you've said, uh, of course, about the Perfect storm, I think that's a wonderful way of describing it. It's nothing anybody could disagree with, I think. I certainly cannot. Uh, uh, and uh, any further, just last comment, so because we're going to go around a lot of times. Anything further about the reason for this perfect storm right now? Well, uh, yes, you know, 
when I listen to the current leaders, I think it's a funny situation. In principle, no one disputes that the Potsdam peace has gone to tatters. Biden and Scholz, Macron and Putin, they say they are saying the same thing, that the problem we face is the old world order has collapsed. Okay, it has collapsed. We should build a new one. But how do we build a new one? What should be what it should be like? Everyone understands it in their own way, except one point. Whatever they have in mind is the same Potsdam world, slightly reconfigured for their respective interests. That is the problem. And we're going to come back to that very important point. So I want to mark that because that's a very important point for us to come back to. Anna, would you like to share some thoughts? Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And I think that uh, these are really the very important questions. And I really would like to uh, be brief, but I would try to uh, show some uh, aspects that are systematic and psychological. So I really try to um, recognize these root causes. So I think there are many socioeconomic reasons for the rising conflicts and turbulence in the world today. And the escalation that we currently face is the result of the accumulated pressure that has been created through the unsustainable system of inequalities and injustice uh, in the last few decades. Uh, democracy on one side that implies equality among the individuals and capitalism on the other side that fosters inequality coexist with tension and cause further gaps between people, groups, nations and states. Uh, democracy often represents also an illusion of equality. We know that political elections can still be won through deceit and manipulation, and which we witness in many countries around the world, even here in Europe. Of course, a high level of freedom and human rights can only be achieved in democracy, which means that we still do not have a better system than the one we call Western democracies. At least that is what we members of the Western society strongly believe. Uh, capitalism, on the other hand, uh, should promote meritocracy, but what we often get is consumerism and creating needs, sometimes even false needs, with the aim of maximizing profit and accumulating wealth. Uh, which is uh, not a human-centered human approach. It is a competitive system with winners and losers. And when we observe uh, the current situation in the world, we note the consequences of this phenomenon very clearly. There are only a few uh, major winners and the others feel the burden of inequality. And as we are aware, inequality generates insecurity. Uh, furthermore, there is and will always be a need for redistribution of wealth. Uh, it cannot be done quickly and efficiently as we would like to, but uh, we hope that it can be done gradually with measures such as universal basic income, the basic needs approach, limiting the wealth of the super rich or combinations or variations of these. Also, um, the causes of conflicts, uh, I think they lie within fostering the consumerist and material side of human nature, as well as a culture of violence, aggression and narcissism. Namely, wars are fought because of greed, superiority complex and unhealthy strive for power and dominance. So we need to reconsider the outcomes of our educational system and acknowledge that learning that does not end by finishing formal education. So as uh, the World Academy stresses in debates on future education, lifelong learning should be recognized and encouraged through many aspects. Also, uh, as we see, the learning outcomes do not correspond to the environment and society that we created. That means that something is wrong in the way we teach. Teaching happens throughout the society, not just within the educational system. We teach and learn through family, media, social media, culture, popular culture, in our work environment, churches, theaters, on the streets. So what we foster every day persists. We must ask ourselves, uh, what emotions, thoughts and deeds do we strengthen every day? Do we understand or do we judge? Do we contribute to polarization or do we build bridges? Also, as it was mentioned today many times, the global era requires global approaches and it requires global leadership. So current conflicts obviously show the lack of efficient global leadership 
as well as a deep moral crisis, namely, as much as science and technology have progressed in the last centuries, the humanities are lagging behind. So we still do not have the answers to fundamental questions that concern humankind in the sense of ethics and ontology, and I dare say metaphysical questions. So the roots of conflicts, in my opinion, lie, lie deep within human nature. As much as they're needed for change and transformation, conflicts must be predicted, controlled, and solved without violence. Conflicts in the world are a projection of unhealed traumas of individuals and groups, lack of emotional intelligence, understanding, and compassion. We heard a lot about it in the previous session. So major conflicts happen despite all the education, upbringing, lecturing, laws, frameworks, strategies, appeals. We thought that we outgrew wars, that we left them in the past millennium, but they're increasing and escalating as we see, uh, which shows that the roots and causes have still not been resolved. We are dealing too much with handling consequences and often forget the causes. When we identify and solve the causes, the consequences will also be solved. So I think that one underlying uh, root cause is also that we underestimate issues either but not recognizing them on, on time or by neglecting them. We have a saying that say, uh, recognize the big when it is small. So nations just like people have their tradition, their past, different starting points and development dynamics. So understanding without judging is as the saying says, highest form of intelligence and could help us overcome the sense of superiority that we all have, both West and East, as well as North and South. So we are a bit, we, are, we all are a bit guilty of trying to force our values and dominance on others, at least through history. So the change starts with an honest and deep critique. Anna, let's step the let's look for the, the solutions a little later. I think you've, okay. you've, yes. been, you've given us an excellent indictment of the present, uh, the present world order and why it should come to collapse or uh, I'm not quite clear uh, as to why it should happen now, but we'll c cover that as we go forward. I'd like to hear from the others in the first round, and then we'll come back to uh, uh, further points. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, thank you, Gary. I think the root cause is mythical thinking. It's uh, uh, passionate, zealot identification and worship of ideas and institutions that we create without a proper sense of realism that we're guests in the web of life and we have to live in harmony with it. So as long as identity is unrealistic and the goal is to fulfill the identities that we create that are not realistic, our are, we won't have solutions to the problems. So when uh, the wisdom of the Upanishads that's, that sits over the parliament in uh, Delhi that says the world is one family, that was a moral and spiritual insight from a long time ago. But because of the reach of science and technology today, that is become a moral imperative and a practical necessity. When we put our differences of nation, religion, race, and class above our common humanity, we're not being realistic. And the more we pursue the myths of these identities, the farther from security we will go because we're not being realistic. Realism, real, realism for the human being will always be in accord with what is good, what is moral, because we're moral creatures. So what is driving, what, what are the institutions that emerge from these identities? They are de jure institutions. They're institutions that we create, the purposes of which are articulated in their missions. Nations come from the, the modern state comes from Westphalia. It's based on borders and concepts that we've created of sovereignty that are supposed to be tools. But when we created them in the 17th century, 
We created them to divide people. The problem that that was being addressed was how to how to get the religious zealots of Protestants and Catholics from slaughtering each other and separating them. But that's not our problem today. And the other major institutions we have are corporations, which were created around a similar historic period, the purpose of which is to increase shareholder value rather than necessarily produce useful goods and services. So I would say that the core problem, I would call it the problem of modernity and our obsession with our intellects without any spiritual and moral foundation, which leads to what I call the forgotten why. It's uh, to talk dirty. It's a problem of teleology, purpose. So without the why, you have law without justice, medicine without healing, education without character, philosophy without the pursuit of truth, art without beauty, religion without love and transcendence, obsessed with rites, rituals, practices, and dogma, and the most and uh, financial systems without focus on producing goods and services. And the most burlesque of all of these distortions is the pursuit of security such that the more the how weaponry is produced, nuclear weapons in particular, the less security is obtained. So we have to come back to the uh, to reevaluate the why the of our part of the solutions. We'll come back yeah. to the solution. But I just want to check. Because it sounds to me you're really, in in very eloquent terms or other eloquent terms, agreeing with what Anna says, that the fundamental basis for our society uh, is not sustainable. But I, I guess maybe I didn't make my my original question quite clear. Why now? We had 30 years where, you know, five years ago, six years ago, it looked like we were gaining momentum on the SDGs and all. We were going in a positive direction in many. Why now suddenly we've hit a, a perfect storm? Uh, is it it, these problems that you uh, indicated and Anna indicated are not new. They've been uh, written through uh, society uh, for centuries, if not at least decades in the modern era. So I'm trying to see if at least through our discussion, we can say this was not inter expected if we had, if it, in, after the end of the Cold War, that we're going to go for 30 years and then suddenly we're going to hit a, uh, or uh, we, when they, the SDGs were drawn up in 2015, there was a certain optimism, uh, unprecedented, 193 countries coming together and saying in 15 years we're going to do all these things, we're going to achieve these goals. I don't think people were bluffing about uh, that uh, there was a lot of support for it. So something I think uh, th there's got to be something more we can understand. Alan, let's. Uh, what what are your thoughts on it? Well, thank you very much, Gary, for bringing us together, and also for the entire conference, which is really illuminating. Um, I haven't had a chance to listen to all of the sessions, but the ones I have have been incredible. Um, I think I'm following up on what Jonathan, who's put sort of like a philosophical and moral, fr mm -hmm. ethical framework, yeah. and I will, I will talk more on the political side. And I think the key issue of why it's a, 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 a storm at the moment is that both national and corporate interest at the moment are triumphing over common security. And I say triumphing because these have been, in a sense, uh, dancing with each other to some degree since the formation of the United Nations, which was established on a common security basis. And the common security basis is that we base our security on international conflict resolution. That's a requirement in the UN Charter and the rule of law. And so the Charter lays down quite strongly that the threat or use of force is prohibited in international relations, uh, except in the case of self-defense, and that states have an obligation to resolve their conflicts through diplomacy, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, adjudication. And that is part of the developing of the order that was sort of like holding the world together. Sometimes it was more to the front than others. We got away from it 
in the height of the Cold War when the two big superpowers were threatening each other with nuclear weapons um, and looked like it was going to destroy civilization. At that time, in stepped Olaf Palmer in 1982, who reminded us collectively, hey, we need to work for common security. That's what the UN was set up about. And that's what that's what's going to be sustainable security, not threatening each other with nukes. Mikhail Gor Gorbachev picked that up and he took forward that idea of common security, of engaging with the West, not in building up more nuclear weapons against them, on working on how to resolve this. And then as the Soviet Union was dissolving to what was supposed to be a more egalitarian model, uh, but Gorbachev put forward the idea of a common security framework for Europe. The problem at that stage was that was rejected by the West. And instead, the West armed NATO. Um, so Gorbachev lost influence in Russia because of that. It looked like he'd failed. You know, the West wasn't interested in common security. And then came Putin, who had a totally different approach. Again, national interest and self-interest. And that then took to the to the fore in, in Russia. Uh, so this is what we've seen, not just in the West and Russia, but also in other areas where corporate interests and national interests uh, triumph over the idea of common security. We are going to have this storm and that common security. We have the elements in there. I disagree with Alexandra. I, I don't think we throw away the common security framework we have. The UN has established a legal framework, a political framework for developing common security. The problem is that countries aren't have invested enough political capital or financial capital. The UN budget, you know, what, $6 billion per year is less than 1% of the global military budget. Only 75 countries have actually accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. If we're going to have a common security order, we need to have everyone adhering to international law. So you should accept the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. So here is so what my thinking is the common security is falling down, but it hasn't collapsed. We still have those elements there. There's still a lot of support for that. Look at the attention that's been given to the International Court of Justice lately because diplomacy has been failing with some of these conflicts and people are looking to the court like, is this a possibility to resolve these? So I think we have the elements there and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, you're, you're saying that... Uh... Things are falling down, uh, uh, and uh, I think you're all agreeing that there's that uh, that our foundation in practice is not sustainable. Uh, you're you're covering it from different perspectives, all of them valid. Uh, I'm not quite sure we got to the, any particular reason why this perfect storm uh, should come all at once, unless. Alan, you were, I'm not sure if you were implying in your opening remarks that in, in, the, uh, in this period after the end of the Cold War, where corporate power and money power just received an unprecedented, uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, I'm trying to understand if I've understood you, uh, that the, the driving force was a new power structure in the world that in the vacuum of the end of the Cold War could grow and globalize beyond nation states, beyond the control of nation states, and uh, create uh, not only new positives, but new instabilities uh, and new competitiveness. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to put your words in your mouth. I'm trying to understand what's happening now. I thought, you know, we, we hear every day in the paper about these different crises, uh, sometimes three on a page, uh, uh, one after another. Uh, and I, my, I wanted to take it, and that's what I'd like to do, is go to the second question, is the reason for the first question was the solutions that we're trying to get now. Uh, Alan, if I heard you right, you're saying we already know the solutions, but we're not practicing them. Well, I don't know, have we been practicing them better in the past, under what circumstances is one thing, uh, or, uh, but, uh, or should we be doing something different? What is the efficacy of the strategies that we're following now? Uh, and whatever the reason for this perfect form, storm is, uh, what do we need to conclude about the strategies and approaches uh, that will help us be more effective than, than we are now? Or are we already doing the maximum possible? OK, Philip? Yes. Um... 
I think we have to, that, that, that has been said to rebuild uh, the world, but I think we have to, to take stock of the, the failure uh, we had during all the, the period after the uh, Second World War. Um, you, you, you should remember the uh, Raymond's Aron formula. Uh, Tomorrow we will arm wisdom without prescribing our human values. The idea of arming wisdom was the hope of the uh, necessity and the creation of the United Nations after the Second World War. But uh, everybody knows the uh, Article 1 of the uh, Charter of the United Nations the, to maintain international peace, security, develop friendly relations, achieve international cooperation. But you, we all know that uh, we we did we don't know the Article uh, 45 and Article 47. And this article was those who gave the capacity, who should give the capacity uh, to uh, Old immediately uh, available forces contingent for combining an international enforcement action to create a military staff, staff committee and, and so on, and we we know that uh, this article uh, stay uh, death letter. In fact, they was they were not applied, so. Uh, that, that create the, the real incapacity of the United Nations. And perhaps we have to take stock of, of that experience and, and change that. Uh, we talk about Ukraine uh, at the incapacity of uh, uh, United Nations to, to act. We, we should stress on, and point out on the incapacity of Europe to act uh, on its own con, con, continent. It was the case uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina in 1995, in Kosovo 1999, and it was the the the, the way 2014 and, and 2022 in Ukraine. We all know all the effort done in uh, in, in Europe to to build institution to try to uh, gather. Uh, um, uh, funding to uh, try to build a uh, uh, European defense system, but in fact they were unable to do it uh, years after years, uh, uh, treaties after treaties, uh, summits after uh, summit, and, and perhaps the the time has come to to build up the European Union strategic and and military autonomy, uh, not to make war, but perhaps to have the, the capacity to uh, to do what Raymond Aron said, to, to have to arm the the the, the, the wisdom and, and to to try to uh, uh, avoid this uh, crisis and uh, who uh, uh, engage human security. Uh, so perhaps a new defense paradigm, that's not all. You should uh, add also uh, a new preventive uh, diplomacy uh, on the uh, on the side because that not with violence that you will stop violence, but probably uh, go in, in in what the president Emmanuel Macron said some some weeks ago, try to 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 build a credible defense to have a credible diplomacy at the uh, European level, but also at the worldwide level. Good, thank you. You know, I, the reason I've been, I was starting to start from the, the cause is because many, many proposals are being put forth for the summit of the future. We've got a lot of work going on on reframing a, the global governance system by certain groups. Uh, so many proposals for governance of AI and everything. Uh, let me just back up for a minute. I'd like to hear any thoughts that you have. If we look at the situation that what's happened in the last 30 years, uh, after the end of the Cold War, we did have remarkable achievements on reduction of military spending by about a third in a few years. Reduction of the nuclear weapons uh, uh, was quite dramatic, very dramatic at, the, at a certain time. 
Uh, the founding of the EU uh, and take off and all the progress in Europe has really been a progress of the uh, of the last, uh, the, I mean, the significant part of it was the last 30 years. We had WTO creating a much more global uh, uh, market than before. We had the internet coming and connecting humanity uh, as never before. And some of the, th I mean, in some ways that uh, there have been tremendous positives. Uh, uh, when we say that we look back and see the failures of to implement the UN Charter, of course, that's not something new. Uh, we have a group that's coming to New York in September to say there's a, 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 a I think it's a, a section 109 or something, article 109 that says the UN Charter should be reviewed every 10 years, and it's never been reviewed uh, since it was uh, drawn up. Uh, we had the De UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, but we know it was never given legal authority. In fact, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Schwartz, Jeff Schwartz said uh, recently, a couple of years ago, I heard him say that the SDGs, Agenda 2030, was really the first attempt to really institutionalize the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in terms of specific goals and targets uh, by 193 countries in the world. So we saw a lot of efforts to move forward on things that were only good on paper before, but were never really given uh, the, the strength they had. At this, that means more people moving together than ever before, more contact between people around the world, especially with the internet and social media, the contacts, uh, more travel, more communications, more interaction, more foreign migration and people living in foreign countries and all. And of course, that means fr from some measure, the, the, the social change in the world has been more rapid in the last 30 years than maybe at any time in history, and increasing. And then we saw suddenly the AI. AI is not the first uh, challenging technology that we have, but suddenly in a couple of months and years, it people who are going into the education now, university, whatever it is, they wonder what jobs will be available two years from now. They don't know what to study. So, the speed of change has been phenomenal. And the reason I'm range, ra raising this is because we hear so much about solutions that are based assuming that we're still living in the same world. Uh, uh, Alexander says this is a perfect storm and you don't come out of a storm and be pretend a perfect storm and pretend that everything's business as usual and we're only gonna do the things we didn't do before. Uh, is it possible that the pace of social change and the stresses generated from the intensity of that change and the contact, the unprecedented contact between cultures from very different perspectives at very different levels of development and all, the stresses and uncertainty of that, it creates, we see it in the US, it creates reactions from those who don't want, who are uncomfortable with the idea of the American uh, uh, character of America changing or the character of Europe uh, changing, uh, or the situation in Eastern Europe changing because Soviet U Russia was an empire for uh, for centuries, uh, having dominant view. Is it possible that our institutions are simply not able to respond quickly enough and dramatically enough to? Uh, and if we're trying to use the same old institutions, I'm thinking particularly of education, because education doesn't seem to be radically changing to keep pace uh, with the, the changes in the world today. Some of you may be closer to it than I am. Uh, Alexander, you're, you're teaching uh, now and, uh, uh, and all. But are we really, is our educational system really coping and preparing students to understand the complexity of the world we live in and give them a new understanding of the direction uh, and, and giving our future leaders that guidance that we need. Is this perfect storm simply because the change has become more than the, the stress of the, uh, the, the patience of society, the, the speed of cultural evolution can withstand? Uh, I'm raising it, whether that hypothesis is valid or not, because in looking at solutions, 
uh, we have to ask whether the kind of solutions that the leaders are focusing on now are really solutions uh, that can work with this great sense of instability and insecurity. Uh, in it, uh, it's fortunate, I, I don't, uh, I think it, uh, but for whatever reason, I have to thank Jonathan for this, for introducing us to the UN uh, uh, Trust Fund on Human Security, because I think human security is really the thing that's most lacking today, in spite of our greatest technology, our greater uh, economic uh, power than anything in the world. And yet we're not getting a, a feeling of greater security. We're getting, in all countries, a greater sense of insecurity. So my, I'm just throwing this out. When we're thinking of solutions, what are the kind of solutions are we going to need that are going to reach uh, the fundamental basis for the perfect storm and, and offer some hope that we can pass through it from some, learn something from it and really move to a new platform. And I think a lot of what the Academy has been saying, and I'm not claiming uh, foresight for this, I'm just, I think a lot of what we're voicing, uh, uh, and Jonathan has been voicing uh, 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 in, in every forum he goes to is that unless the basis for peace is, is, is a sense of human security. It, when, that, when that basic security is gone, whether it's jobs going to China or AI taking over uh, 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 for, for the work we're doing or something else, when that insecurity is there, you get any demagogue coming in and saying the problem is with the current leaders and we have to go back to something old. We, uh, and maybe that's what Putin's doing now, gain the security of a society which nobody around them could uh, could disagree uh, or or question. I'm just trying to throw out some ideas for further reflection. Uh, can we look at the current approaches? We've known about climate change for a long time. Now we get a feeling. I think most people say there's no way we can handle it. Uh, we're get, it's too late. It's too late to do the SDGs. We're so far behind. Uh, and when it's too late, what do you do? You, you don't follow anymore. What's the sense of worrying about it? Let's just, uh, uh, and what does the, the young generation do? Any thoughts from anybody? I'd like to just take it as, as you, you care. You can go in any line you want. My, uh, my, the purpose of the discussion was to really, I see, uh, okay, thanks, Alan. I, didn't, I was looking a little down and uh, didn't see your hand up there. I think the, 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 the idea is, I'm not worried about the order, sequence, logic, or even consensus that we get. I think the idea was to see whether a different type of thinking uh, is needed uh, and where, what we, where we might end, where come out of this, uh, where we start. Alan, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to follow up a little bit more on uh, international conflict resolution and the role of law. If you look under the UN Charter, which, you know, the UN, the principal purpose was to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And so in the UN Charter, it, it has obligations uh, not to threaten or use force and the obligations to resolve conflicts peacefully. But this has been breaking down. Now, what where it's been breaking down is that there has been less capacity or maybe less leadership. When there's good leadership uh, and when there's good conditions, then international conflicts can be resolved through diplomacy, through negotiation. But when the conditions are changing and when there's a leadership is not so visionary or, or excellent uh, and that breaks down, then what we see now is recourse to armed conflict in so many places. What we should be doing instead is using the other aspects that are there in the UN Charter. And that includes mediation, arbitration, and adjudication. And these work. And I know because my country has been involved in this, New Zealand, in a number of different situations. We've done mediation to resolve the situation when France blew up our peace boat in the harbour. And then we caught their agents. France put an economic boycott of New Zealand. So we couldn't sell any products in the whole of the European Union. Uh, France was much more powerful than New Zealand. We used mediation from the UN Secretary General. We resolved that conflict. Uh, International Court of Justice. There are a number of times when a smaller, less powerful country has taken a more powerful country to the International Court of Justice and won. And that more powerful country 
has has uh, accepted the decision or at least implemented it, sometimes reluctantly. I mean, Libya versus Chad. You know, Libya had invaded, you know, the Chad, the disputed territory. Uh, the court found in favour of Chad, which is much less powerful than Libya, and Libya then accepted the decision of the court and withdrew their military and signed the peace agreement. Uh, Nicaragua versus United States. If you know this, you know, Ronald Reagan was supporting the Contras against, you know, the Nicaraguan government. Nicaragua won the case in the court. Ron Reagan said United States would not go along with it, but the Congress passed the Bolin Amendment. There were court cases in the US. Uh, it gave Oscar Arias, that court decision gave Oscar Arias the legal and political capital to negotiate the Central American peace accords, which helped resolve the conflicts within Central America. And the United States basically ended up having to accept the decision from the court. There are numerous other examples of how effective the International Court of Justice can be. Now, we just heard, heard from the president of the International Court of Justice, uh, the US judge, Judge Donahue, when she testified to the, uh, to the Security Council last year, how most of the decisions of the court are actually accepted and implemented. The problem is, at the moment, is that we don't utilize it sufficiently. As I said, only 74 UN member states accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. So some of those critical cases which could be resolved through law just don't get to the court. So we need to put more emphasis on encouraging countries to accept the jurisdiction, on giving more resources to the court, because it's got a huge caseload, 30, nearly 30 cases on the court docket at the moment, and it's just they don't have the capacity to run through the cases quickly. Uh, we need to give more resources uh, to the court to be able to, to take on all these, all these cases. And that would be a, a, a key way that we'd be able to resolve some of these conflicts. And why is it a key way? Because the court uh, drops it from a confrontational political approach we have one side versus another to a historical approach, the facts and the application of law. Many times through the investigative process of the court and the laying out of the background to this, it's actually ended up with the two sides being able to find some way of negotiating a, a settlement uh, based on, on the fact that it was in the court. It's a face-saving way. It provides a factual basis, provides a political solution uh, when, when without taking that it's so so difficult so i emphasize we have that as one of the tools in the un there are other tools as well and i would emphasize that the un secretary general a new agenda for peace did such a good job of highlighting that we have incredible tools there we just need to make better use of them and that's what the un summit of the future is primarily about making better use of the legal and diplomatic tools the tools for creating common security that just aren't emphasized enough at the moment thanks thank you Alan. thank you I wanted to uh, point out some of the chat messages that uh, we just got. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. One from Michael Marion, when you asked the question, why now? I'll read out a part of his, his comment. The major root cause for our global backsliding is too much useful and entertaining information by too many people in too many media promoting fragmentation. This promotes authoritarian leadership, also, fra academic fragmentation and vertical thinking inhibits the horizontal thinking, such as human security for all. That, that is one. And, and then just another okay. comment from Natalia Tumaha. This is part of a much uh, longer message. As for the solution, what she proposes is we must all focus our attention at the starting point for solving our global problems, not on what divides us, but on what unites us be able to look at the situation through the eyes of the other side. And she quotes Tolstoy, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. It's, it's part of a much longer uh, message. And, and we'll save all these chat messages so that we can uh, go through them in detail later. Good. Thank you, Janani. You can draw on other messages as they come up and, and keep us informed. Thank you. Other thoughts? Anna's got her hand raised. May I? Uh, Anna, please. Yes. yes. Uh, so I'll go back to uh, the root causes. So the 
uh, the we must make a distinction between the root causes and the consequences. So what we see now are the consequences, but the causes are always philosophical and psychological. And I strongly agree with Jonathan what he said. And if you say that all these issues that uh, we mentioned before are not new, so why didn't we solve them? Why did we? Uh, underestimate them why we neglected them why didn't we react when we had the chance so some people think of course we are living in the best world ever so medicine uh, uh, science uh, technology is progressing rapidly we are uh, we have the globalization uh, we travel uh, we connect through social media so those are all positive uh, sides but what are the uh, dangers is that uh, we always come back to ethics so whatever happens uh, in within the stem uh, field we always come back to ethics and the unethical use the risks the so the problem remains the human nature so we can't neglect the root causes of um for example um uh, that ed our education is maybe uh neglecting practical psychology uh, empathy uh cooperation uh, uh, conflict solving uh, emotional intelligence so whatever we do, we have this uh, trajectory of uh, STEM progressively rising. But on the other hand, uh, the humanities are always uh, slowly, slowly, slowly rising or even stagnating. So I think these uh, psychological, spiritual, philosophical questions are really uh, the major part of the solution. I agree that we have to, with Ellen, what he said, we have to have, I'm a diplomat, so we have to uh, mediate, we have to cooperate, we need more cooperation, less competitiveness, we need, uh, as the uh, one of the persons in the comments said, we need to focus on what unites us, not on what divides us, we need more dialogue, less debating, we need more understanding, less judging, uh, and what Jonathan said, we need to focus on the why in every situation. So I think that it would be uh, useful to make steps for the future. So today we had a big conversation here in Berlin about future wars. So why are we talking about wars? So we still don't work about future. We don't talk about future peace, but we see how the wars will look like in the future. So we don't solve uh, the causes, but we only see what types of different consequences we will face in the future. And that's an important uh, I, statement you've made and something of what we had in mind in this session. If, if even now we're continuing to think in the way that has caused the problems in the first place or allowed them to be caused, uh, don't we need a different type of thinking? Uh, uh, from that. Jonathan. Yeah, I go back to realism. Uh, mythical thinking is entertaining. Sometimes it's useful for psychological un uh, uncovering like religious mythology. Uh, but you can't drive on a mountain road using a myth. You have to have an actual realistic map. And I go back to saying our two major institutional structures that we create, one for security and one for producing goods and services, are both the wrong bus. Our definition of security is founded on nationalism and militarism, which the more you perfect it now, the less security you get. Yeah. And the way we produce goods and services is largely generated by the Limited Liability Corporation, which is a fairly very recent institution that's not focused on protecting the regenerative processes of nature, which is a given. In fact, the more we go into the AI world, the more we go into the digitalized way of understanding the natural world, the farther we go from actually understanding its underlying structures its mystery, and its purpose. We get more fascinated by the how in which we do things and go farther away from the why. 
So we need a story, a story commensurate with the real world, a story that includes the moral and practical imperative of being in harmony with the natural world, not dominating it. That's not a realistic approach. If the human community continues with the pursuit of trying to dominate the natural world, we will move farther and farther away from security because Mother Nature has its own rules and we can't dominate it. And we shouldn't because that, that takes us away from our human purpose. Last but not least, as I was saying, we've forgotten our purposes in institutions and education without character. Education without having an understanding of what it is to be human is producing people who actually pursue domination and selfishness, com a competitive ethos uh, that uh, uh, privileges and reinforces, uh, reinforces alienation, and arrogance, uh, which doesn't lead to fulfillment. So it comes back to the qualities and the institutions that are realistic with the natural world and spirit and the, and the spirit of being human, which is founded on qualities that liberate us from the illusion of being separate. What are those qualities? Love, compassion, justice, patience, peacefulness. They're not in our educational system. They're not, they're, they're not, at least in the United States, they're intentionally kept out. And in the, in the institutions that even pay lip service to them are largely in the religious community, which, only re which largely reinforces separation, which takes us farther away from love, compassion, and so forth. So it seems to me that we need to be, have a story. Stories are really important. We need to have a political story that's in accord with the reality of the natural world and the reality that in the Anthropocene, um, the neighborhood is a moral location and our identity as human beings, our core humanity has to come first. As founders of WAS said, remember your humanity, forget the rest. And what is our humanity? Our humanity is a very, a very um, noble, dignified, beautiful blessing. We're not just consumers. We're not just consumers and we're not here just to survive. We're here to thrive and to, and to soar. We have a purpose as human beings and, we for, and our institutions are not reinforcing that purpose. I know this, this, but there are practical implications for what I'm saying. You know, if, if you take the practical implications of, uh, of, the, of the de jure institutions that produce goods and services, it means that their 10K reports, their quarterly reports, have to include impact on the natural world, not as if the natural world is an externality that you don't have to mention. So these are the, the, the philosophical change I'm talking about can translate very quickly into policies. So just take that one, for example. The, the, the central banks of the world at, in Glasgow came out and said they want to include climate impact in their loan portfolios. And now we're in an actual debate at a bureaucratic level in the United States as to whether uh, securities and exchange uh, reporting, uh, quarterly reports of corpora corporations, should include some ex what are called externalities. The idea that the real world is an externality to what you're reporting is kind of insane because it's basically saying we're only going to report on the artificial world we've created, the financial institutions, and we'll treat the real world as optional. That's crazy. That's drive. That's that. Or I would say that's like driving on a mountain road with an illusory map. The real world is our point of reference. And there are policy implications also in talking about the reality of uh, the, the world being one family, because no country, no country can survive if we don't protect the climate collectively, if we don't protect the oceans collectively. And the pursuit of, the pursuit of national identity over collective security is, it, we, it's not mutually assured destruction, it's self-assured destruction. So I come, I come back to these, why the, you know, in the 17th century, the idea of the state was kind of a fantastic idea. 
And there were a bunch of wonks who just, you know, put it out there. So ideas can matter. And the United States is founded on an idea that an ought that we haven't achieved yet, but it's a compelling ought. All people are created equal. It's being challenged by the same by the same uh, by the same ignorance that pursues domination. Sure. So this battle between you know this battle between our humanity and uh, and, and 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 humility uh, and and caring for one another versus selfishness is not new. It's only that in the Anthropocene, if we make a, if we continue to go the wrong direction. We 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 have the capacity for the first time to destroy the future. That's new, and Gary, I think that's something that's really important to mention when you're talking about uh, accelerated change. Yeah. The the uh, the the our impact on the natural world is Absolutely. geometrically increasing, Absolutely. and we just hit a tipping point in the last few years in which the institutions that I would say, as Wangari and Mattia say, are the wrong bus, have reached a point in which our misdefinition of security is showing up in Gaza and, and Ukraine, and our misdefinition of how we pursue human well-being is showing up in climate. But it's also showing up in destroying species. It's also showing up in putting the Gulf Stream at risk, which would be absolutely devastating. It's showing up across the board. And I come back to the core, the core purpose of the state, the core purpose of the corporation. And that's in our gift. That could be created by words, words and stories. Okay. But it's not a story that it's a gift to be human. It's not a story that we're going to die. It's not a story that we have love is in our capacity. It's not a story that there are some people that live in myths and some people are wise. It's not a story that um, that uh, the human being is a fantastic noble creature that can can either um, thrive or destroy. That's not a story. These are realities. Thank you, Jonathan, for a very rich comment and for the comments that have come before. I'll just give you one last opportunity for maximum, say, two, two minutes each, and then uh, it's been at the end of a, of a, of a long, full, full day full of ideas. So uh, anyone who would like to, this is not compulsory, we've already heard a lot, but anybody who'd like to make uh, uh, just whatever's left on your mind for two, three minutes, Alexander, please. Uh, John, uh, thank you very much, Gary. I wanted to answer to Jonathan about realism and uh, the story thing. And I wanted to mention, uh, it's not the conclusion of my conclusion, but if you give, don't give me another opportunity, it's okay. You know, Jonathan, I've listened, it's very interesting, but at the same time, I was a little bit confused because realism is a very tricky concept. I'm sure you understand that. I'm, I'm give, I'll give you my personal experience. I was about four years old. Just imagine Moscow after the war. My mother walks me as a child through the groceries because in one she can get some bread, on it, in another some milk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And while we walk, suddenly we see a crowd of people, and there is a bus stop, and a person falls down, holds his throat, becomes red, and starts to suffocate. And people surround him, not knowing what to do. And suddenly a small woman jumps out of this crowd and shouts, men, some of you, do you have a knife? Men, nobody reacted. So she looked around, found an empty bottle, struck the it against the road, and then with a piece of glass, cut it into his throat. Blood bubbled out, and she and he was and she was almost lynched by the crowd there immediately. But at that time, the uh, emergency came. Somebody called on the telephone in from the booth, and uh, the emergency came, and the doctor came. Stop it, stop it. She saved his life. He was suffocating because of the 
uh, allergy. And she opened the right. realism dictated to everybody that she killed him. So we should be very cautious with the ideas of realism being on top of everything. After all, after all, if we are talking about moral values, ideas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it has never been realism. It has always been a product of human mind, which is not realism. So I would say I would appreciate to have some time so that we could correlate our views together on this issue. And can I just a couple of words on no, this? No, please, subject? you you give your your yes. So please, I go ahead. The go biggest ahead. problem today, and the source of this mess messiness of the geopolitic geopolitical situation is the lack of consensus about the global distribution of power. Mm -hmm. Who runs the world? Do we still have a world of U.S. hegemony? Is it a bipolar or multipolar world? Or are states no longer the globe's only actor? Great. Do we instead live in a, an age, as some argue, technopolarity, mm -hmm. where corporate titans such as Amazon, Apple, Google, etc., are the new great powers, in fact? Today's circumstances call for an updated operating system. What has existed after the end of the war? I mean, even not the Cold War, but the Second World War. We need a new operating system, effective multilateralism. I prefer plurilateralism. That is based not only on the Westphalian sovereign state pattern, but involves also nascent stakeholders of the global international society because we are being now part more and more of the international society thanks to the digital opportunity and networks that exist today. And if in the past we were invited to vote every four years during the elections, national elections, now we are expressing our preference every day through Facebook, through Instagram, through Telegram, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It all must be taken into account. Otherwise, we will remain in among the wishful thinkers, trying to achieve all the best, being against all the evil, but not going ahead on any particular issue. Uh, we are talking about. I think this is the key problem of the today. I think that sovereign states have been mythologized for 400 years as a natural unit of political order. But history shows how new they are. If we compare with, with the history length, it's only 400 years. And how we can think now beyond them. This is the most important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I must say there have been some very rich comments in this session, uh, and uh, I will give uh, Alan a, a chance to comment as well. What, uh, what, what, what Jonathan said about the basis for real peace is not national uh, security. What Alexander said about the center of power is no longer in the governments than the nation states. And, and that's a, that we see the weakness that comes uh, uh, or the confusion that comes when other powers that are not covered by, uh, uh, are not strictly under anybody's control are, uh, are let loose. This is the kind of thinking I'd like to see more of in the academy as we go forward to try to really look at new paradigms of thought about what's happening and what's emerging. Uh, and that's, that's what I hope for. So we've got a few hands up for our final comments. Philip, last remarks, two, three minutes. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I share many things that have been uh, said. Three points. Why are we there? Probably but because uh, we were yesterday and we are also today uh, too optimist 
about the humankind. And because we are on that part of the world where we could be optimistic. I think that that's a, a, a point. The second one is about diplomacy. Uh, we have the impression that there is no real diplomatic effort uh, to put an end uh, to the, the wars uh, in Ukraine or uh, in Gaza. And uh, in fact, wars threaten human security, that had been said, but benefit some other humans. And that's the point we have to to, to tackle because uh, that's not uh, uh, all uh, equal sum uh, uh, play. Three, um, as you said, Gary, education is central. Uh, it must be an education that frees us from our certainty. So what conviction and knowledge can be brought into dialogue. And our conviction and the conviction of others and uh, that could be established common shared knowledge stabilized by the uh, deliberation, by the sharing between uh, the, the different people and, and the, the people that are so different in the different parts of the world. This knowledge obviously requires an understanding of the other and of the temporal tra trajectories, the past, the present, and the future. And I think that is very important and linked to the foresight you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. Alan, last couple of minutes, remarks. Last Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. I don't have anything to add in terms of comments, but just I put into the chat four documents, which go into those in a little bit more depth. One is the uh, Legal Alternatives to War campaign. We have about 100 organisations participating in this, highlighting how we can more effectively use the International Court of Justice to resolve international conflicts and, sh and ensure the implementation of international law. Um, also, just the background, success stories from the International National Court of Justice. We hear failures, but there's no publicity about all the success stories. So we've started and we'll be doing some online events just to highlight some of the incredible success stories there have been. And I put one document in there. And also on common security, um, the article that I did for Cadmus on the promise of peace and nuclear abolition has large power aggression destroyed Wonderful common life. security. And I put the link in there. And thank you very much, Gary, for the opportunity to write thank something you. in more detail about that. And even with the disturbing circumstances we are in the world at the moment, I still have some optimism <laughs> that we could pull this around. And then the common security platform where we're also bringing together other partners in building the idea of common security and how we can rebuild that as the main approach for ensuring that we can prevent war, resolve conflicts, ensure the implementation of law. Thank you very much. Those links are in the chat. It's bringing a lot of people together and a lot of thoughts together more than ever before. Last comments, uh, Anna. Thank you. Uh, regarding the global dimension, so current conflicts, but also future, uh, I think we must strengthen the global citizenship paradigm. So the cosmopolitan democracy, I'm a strong supporter of a world government and a world parliament or a UN parliamentary assembly. And I think those are all instruments uh, which can help the cosmopolitan democracy or something that will be transnational and non-aligned with many of the uh, with any of the major blocks right now. And of course, with my last remark, I would like to go back to education. And in two segments, one is ethics, the other is psychology. That means empathy, compassion, uh, love, uh, uh, universal brotherhood and stuff like that. So when we see uh, today's leaders, the, the ones that are also starting wars are highly intelligent. They are very successful and they are very educated. We can all agree on that. But on the morality of their actions. So we see that ethics there plays a role. 
regarding anti artificial intelligence, technology, uh, medicine, pharmaceutical uh, industry, we see that it's all progressing, but the ethical component is a problem. Social media and media uh, connecting the world. So it's a major opportunity, but the ethical, uh, the ethical, the moral side is problematic. So I will finish with uh, the uh, for, uh, we'd finish with my, with uh, the thought of uh, the importance of education and we're doing it for the future generations we can have instant remedies so we must think about future generations and foster ethics and practical psychology thank you anna thank you very much jonathan last word uh, thank you we know that genetically all of us are 99.99% the same. The difference between anybody in this call is, is less than 1%. So our common humanity is very, very uh, affirmed, in my opinion, by the fact that we all depend upon the health of the oceans, which provides the phytoplankton, which is 60% of our oxygen. So not only are we genetically very similar as people, but we're actually being breathed by the same phenomena. Th now, uh, Alexander, I agree with you. Zealotry and understanding realism is very dangerous. Uh, the real world is mysterious beyond our measure. Quantum, quantum physics lets, uh, lets us know this. But there are certain facts, like I've just stated, that we all depend on the third lung that that are being ignored in our major institutions. The fact of our common humanity is being ignored in religions and nations and in our education. So I, I think that uh, we need to come back to some uh, moral guidelines and some better uses of science to define what is real. The moral guideline that I like, that I haven't heard enough is love people, use things, never love things and use people. And I would go and agree with you, my idea of what's real is a thing. And my idea of what's real should never get ahead of my loving people. Thank you. Alexander, One, last word? Last word, just a reaction. You know, Jonathan, I've just had three hours today with a group of students from our school that were on strike, on protest with pro-Palestinians. And uh, the school asked me to uh, make a talk to them. It was supposed for one hour. It lasted three hours altogether. And uh, I'm just wondering if I told them that all the Palestinians and Israels are just one hundredths of a percent where I would be, would have been now. <laughs> I want to thank you all and thank all of those who have been listening and inviting all of you to share further thoughts that come up when you wake up tomorrow or uh, when we circulate the text and the, uh, and the recording. The purpose was to stimulate fresh thinking on this, and I think we have done that, and I appreciate the contributions of everybody. Thank you for your patience. I, when, we, when they organized this session, I thought surely this is going to be, this is the most challenging session of the General Assembly, and it was intended to be. We needed a little, uh, a little out of the box, and you've helped us do it. Thank you. And we're going to do come back uh, at the end of the 20, June 26th for the third and last session, we're going to have something. How do we go f forward from this? What have we learned? We get a month, six weeks to think about what we've discussed and what we've learned. Thank you all very much and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, next month. Bye now.